program series Nobel Conference, The Legacy of Einstein, is produced in partnership with Gustavus Adolphus College and TPT's Minnesota Channel. This program was recorded September 27th and 28th, 2005, at the college during its 41st Nobel Conference, celebrating the 100th anniversary of Einstein's Annus Mirabilis papers, which provided a foundation for modern physics. The Nobel Conference really came about following the dedication of the Nobel Hall of Science in 1963. This was dedicated as the American Memorial to Alfred Nobel. And during the course of these ceremonies, I believe it was Ralph Bunch in his closing talk, mentioned that it would be a good idea to have a perpetual living memorial to Alfred Nobel in the form of a conference that would be held every year. Uh, we started out as a conference primarily planned by Nobel Prize winners in the natural sciences. So our topics have tended to be gravitating towards the natural sciences. Uh, we've remained pretty true to that. And uh, what I think what we've tried to do, and I think what we've been pretty successful at, is we try to bring real science to real people, so to speak. Gustavus is involved in the Nobel Conference because it's a, it's a very distinctive opportunity. It's a distinctive opportunity for the college to showcase a lot of what it is for people coming down to campus. That's important to us. It's an important opportunity to showcase science and the relationship between science and, and religion, and science and theology, which is always woven into the Nobel Conference as well. So there's a relationship here between the sciences and theology between reason and faith that we talk about a lot here on this campus. But the conference elevates that to a very high level with the presence of people coming from outside who really add a lot to what we already have here. Well, thank you very much for that. Welcome, I'm very pleased to be here. I think this is a wonderful series of meetings and it's great to be with you at this place. I'm honored to have been asked. So I'm going to talk about this issue of the um, existence of life in the universe and the crucial issue of ethics. It's a brief review of cosmology today and then followed by some reflections on how it is that the universe allows intelligent life to come into existence. What, if anything, this has to do with the concepts of morality and compassion? which relates to the key issue of ethics and the survival of the human race. So I'm going to be kind of mixing areas of it. The universe, as we've heard, is a vast scale. It's expanding. It has started off in a hot Big Bang. Structures such as galaxies clustered formed by gravitational attraction. Stars and planets formed in this environment and provided the environment for life to exist. And it is these stars and planets, our particular star, our particular planet, that have made our life possible. So the universe is the environment which has allowed us to come into being. As you follow the universe back in time, it was smaller and smaller. That's what we saw in the last diagram. Therefore, it heats up. Any gas as you compress it gets hotter and hotter. And we had the hot Big Bang era we've already heard a little bit about. What's important there, at these temperatures, equilibrium occurs between the matter and the radiation. You have matter and radiation, and they have the same temperature because they're in equilibrium. And you get black body radiation. We've already heard about that. You've seen the spectral curves. That will occur because you've got equilibrium. That's a prediction from statistical physics. And then as the universe cools, this radiation will cool, and we will find, it's a prediction, the remnants of this hot Big Bang era should be this radiation, and we've heard this was observationally discovered in 1965 at a temperature of 2.75 Kelvin. That is 2.75 degrees absolute, minus 270 degrees centigrade, and it's because it is so incredibly cool, much cooler than most objects on Earth, that we have to have incredibly sensitive uh, measurements to detect this radiation. That's why it was only discovered as late as 1965. And as we've heard, the discovery of this radiation vindicates the application of standard physics to the early universe. It says cosmologists are right. You can take physics here and now, apply it to the early universe, and you get results which are verified by observations. 
We've already heard the universe, um, as the universe expands, the radiation reaches us from a surface of large scattering at a temperature of about 4,000 degrees Kelvin. Heavy elements needed for life do not form in the early universe. Everything you see in this room is made out of heavy elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, iron, and so on. None of that existed in the early universe. None of that existed at the surface of large scattering. What happened is those formed in the interiors of stars much later on, and then got blown out through space through the supernova explosions that you've heard about, and then second generation stars can result from the remnants of supernova and it's only second generation stars which can have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen uh, in, in their interiors and can have planets containing those substances circling. So this, it is crucial for life on Earth that firstly, these elements were cooked in the interiors of stars and secondly, that they were then spread through space through supernova explosions and became available for the next generation of stars to have planets around them. Without this, we wouldn't be here. And this idea of inflation, there's an enormously rapid, very, very brief expansion through taking place through many, many e-foldings, huge number of times before the subsequent hot Big Bang era, because while this expansion took place, there's a scale of field making it happen. The radiation cools to effectively actually zero, and any matter that might be there will cool to zero because of this huge expansion. So the universe actually was incredibly cold there. At the end of this time, the scale of field decays away and converts into radiation and reheats. That's the start of the hot Big Bang expansion of the universe. And so this picture shows the same thing. You've already seen it in several versions. Time goes from left to right. There's the Big Bang preceding inflation. I'll say a word about that in a minute. Then there's inflation. The quarks mix together to give the protons and neutrons. You then get the, um, over here, element formation. Um, you get the decoupling of matter and radiation here. First galaxies here, the modern universe here and we are here at somewhere between 12 to 15 billion years. This is the brief history of the universe showing you in a diagrammatic form the expansion of the universe from the hot big bang epoch. In the end, we do not know if there was a start to the universe or not. One of the big questions of cosmology, the classical theory says there was a start. Quantum cosmology, there are some theories in quantum cosmology which says there was not a start. And in fact, the loop quantum gravity theory says there are models where there was no start to the universe. The string theory has not, to my knowledge, come up with a definitive statement there was a start to the universe or there wasn't. And this is one of the unknowns, whether the universe actually had a start or whether it could have been in some kind of infinite state. I personally have recently published a paper in which the universe did last forever. It started off in a static state. And it stood in that static state for effectively an infinite amount of time and eventually it broke away and expanded and went into a standard inflationary expansionary epoch. That is a possible evolution which could have happened. And so we don't know if the universe actually had a start or not. What I want to talk about now, this is the context for humanity. Life occurs in this context. The laws of physics plus the boundary conditions for the universe allow life to exist. This is what I want to explore a little bit. The first life on Earth arose by some kind of accident. We still don't really know how that happened, but then there was a continuum proven by the Darwinian processes of um, natural selection, a continual accretion of biological information, and the creation of higher order structures. There was the emergence of complexity, and I think you've already discussed this in other conf uh, conferences here. The eventual emergence of mind and consciousness took place with language, society, and social constructions coming out of that initial hot Big Bang. So what came out of the hot Big Bang was all of these wonderful things that we see around us and some not so wonderful things. The statement I want to make now is the conditions for the existence of life. Significant alteration of either physical laws or boundary conditions at the beginning of the universe would prevent the existence of intelligent life as we know it in the universe. If you alter either the physical laws or the boundary conditions at the beginning of the universe too much, then life will not come into existence. If the physical laws were altered by a remarkably little amount, no evolutionary process at all of living beings would be possible. 
So these laws appear fine-tuned to allow the existence of life. Um, this is the statement which I would claim is a scientific statement, except perhaps if you delete that last part there. The rest of this is scientific fact. The last part is an opinion about those facts. These laws appear fine-tuned to allow the existence of life. Why does the universe have the peculiar properties that allow intelligent life to exist? This is what is called the anthropic issue. It's claimed by some that this is because of the physical existence of ensembles of universes or multiverses, and Professor Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal of Great Britain, is one of the people writing about this, for instance, in a recent book called Our Cosmic Habitat. It's being increasingly defended because it's the only purely scientific approach to solving the puzzles raised by the anthropic issue. And the idea is, think of an ensemble of universes. We aren't the only universe. There's millions and millions and millions of other universes out there. If you scatter properties around in those universes, the claim is most of them will get it wrong. Most of them will be dead universes for one or other of the reasons I've said, but a few of them will get it right. And if you have enough universes out there with enough variation of properties, it becomes inevitable. Someone will get it right. There will exist universes where life can occur. That is the reason, it is claimed, why life can exist, why the universe in which we exist is such that life can come into existence. We live in what such universe. For example, this argument has been used to explain the value of the cosmological constant. And fundamental physics, we've already heard about this, says the cosmological constant should be immensely bigger than the actual value. Why is it so incredibly small relative to what basic quantum theory suggests? And Professor Steven Weinberg and others say, look, imagine a multiverse with all sorts of values of the cosmological constant. There will be out on the tail of the distribution some with a very small value, and life can come into existence in those universes which are highly atypical, but nevertheless they will exist, and that is how life can come into being, because those universes will have cosmological constant that will allow us to exist. This idea of the multiverse potentially brings cosmology within the realm of statistical analysis. It gives a basis for probability. Physicists love to do probability calculations, and a, co a multiverse says, look, you can do statistics because you've got this ensemble of universes. Uh, it provides the only scientific basis for attempts to use the anthropic principle to determine the values of parameters such as the cosmological constants, as I've just briefly explained, for which we otherwise have no plausible explanation. But it is completely unverifiable, and in my view, this is a metaphysical explanation, not a physics explanation. Either these are way beyond the horizon, and we may believe they exist because a theory called chaotic inflation says they ought to exist. The physics underlying chaotic inflation is not tested, has not been tested, and may never be tested. We receive no light. They are beyond the horizon. There is no information which comes to us from these domains. I can say anything I like about them. You can say anything else you like about them, and nobody can prove I'm right and you are wrong. Maybe they're peopled by dwarves and elves, or maybe Harry Potter is out there somewhere in one of those universes. You can say anything you want, and it cannot be verified and tested in any way. To my mind, that is the hallmark of an unscientific one. Well, not unscientific, but it's a theory which cannot be scientifically tested, which is why I would call it metaphysics rather than physics. In my view, belief in such a multiverse is based in faith rather than evidence. Now, there, you will get these books by Professor Martin Rees and others trying to say this is part of science. I dispute that claim. In my view, this is part of metaphysics, not science. As metaphysics, it's a good guess. It's not a bad metaphysical theory, but you mustn't claim it's a scientific theory. Now, the question then comes, are we alone? Ha! Ah. <laughs> well, given the laws which I've just been looking at. In our universe, those laws are right so that life can exist, and that's one thing we know for sure. If we can also say planets exist, then in my view, life is almost inevitable, because once those laws are right for life, then they are become prolific. It becomes almost inevitable life will exist. Now, there are some people who dispute that, but I think most workers who've thought about this feel that once you've got the laws right so they are favorable for life, then life will indeed come into existence, because you've got this incredible number of galaxies with this incredible number of stars, 
the only question, well, one of the questions is, are there planets around those stars? And we have been getting wonderful evidence about that recently from astronomy. Planets form from planetary proto-disks. Do we see them? Yes, we see them. Here's some in the Orion Nebulae. Here is Beta Pictoris, a sideway view of such a disk. And one of the really fascinating areas of astronomy at the moment is trying to prove there are planets out there which could be good habitats for life. The problem is we can quite easily show there are planets like Jupiter. It's much more difficult to show that circling another star there is a planet like the Earth. But it's a very good guess that they do exist. In my view, almost certainly we are not alone. There are many, many others out there, vast numbers, because the numbers of stars out there, 10 to the 22, is so huge, and the laws of physics are in favor of life coming to existence. Completely distant question is, are they in communicable distance? That is pretty unlikely, because we only can get signals at the speed of light. They would have to be relatively close to us in order to get in communication with them. So my view is they are out there. It would, it would be a very, very big fluke if they were close enough for us to communicate with. But nevertheless, we can ask if they are there, how like us will they be? Will we still in some sense be alone even if they exist? And there's some very interesting articles recently in books on the convergence of biochemistry and of the mechanics of life. In fact, if you start thinking about this, there's only a restricted number of ways to solve the problems of life because life has universal necessities. And there's a book by Simon Conway Morris called Life Solution, Inevitable Humans in a Lonely Universe. And a book by a man called Fogel called Cat's Paws, Catapults and Catapults mechanical worlds of nature and people. He compares how nature solves problems and how engineers solve problems. And there's only limited ways to solve problems mechanically, electrically, biochemically. If you're living, you need eyes, you need ears or something. You, you need some senses, either eyes or ears or smell, something in order that you can interact with the earth. You need a brain to process that information or those senses are no good. You need limbs to move around unless you're a plant. <laughs> you need a way of taking food in and of disposing of waste. They're universal necessities for life. And it doesn't matter what the life looks like. Any reasonable definition of life must have these things. In my view, it is almost certain that any other life that might exist in the universe will be carbon-based, and I'll go further than that. I believe they will be based on the combination of RNA and DNA. Now, this is a controversial statement because I can't prove it's correct, but on the other hand, you can't prove me wrong. <laughs> There's a convergence of microbiology, such as the citric acid cycle, which is the center of the energy cycle in every cell. And the point about it is what is done by the RNA and DNA, the storage of information, the reading out of the information, the way that it is used to make proteins and so on, it's unbelievably complex, wonderful process, which happens it's allowed by carbon. No other chemical element on Earth has got anything like those properties. And we know, so we're assuming that the laws of physics are the same as here, and now we're talking about a universe where the laws are the same as on this Earth. I don't believe there's any remotely plausible other basis for life than carbon, RNA, DNA. Life has this hierarchical structure, starting at the bottom, chemical elements with chemical binding, the building rock molecules, which combine to form polymers, the macromolecules, which fold and have recognition and binding, like DNA, the organelles, which govern cell homeostasis, the cells themselves, the building blocks of life, which grow, they specialize, and they die. They mesh together to form tissues, which grow, maintain themselves, repair themselves. The tissues form limbs and physiological systems which allow organism homeostasis. The individual organisms are the whole, where the whole thing works together with coherent physiological functioning. These form animal populations with competition in the food chain. These live in ecosystems with species independence and competition. These live in biomes, the energy and material interchange, and the whole forms a biosphere with global resource cycles. So the question is, if we came on life on another planet, which of this would it have? I claim it would have the lot. Because in order to have a complex human being, you have got to have this hierarchical structure. There's no other way to build up complexity. So I think if we were to find 
life anywhere else in the universe, it would be carbon-based, RNA, DNA, and this entire structure that we see here would be out there. That still leaves an unbelievable variety of possibilities. They could look totally different, they could function totally different, but nevertheless, I think they would have these properties. So the DNA double helix, it has this incredibly complex structure. I think probably that would be what you would find. You would probably find the same, yeah, you would find the same base pairs. And of course, what is happening here, there's this remarkable way in which they fit together in complementary pairs with the thymine and the adenine fitting together with exactly a distance which is exactly paired with the distance between cytosine and guanine. If these distances weren't the same, DNA wouldn't work. It's all this kind of thing which is so remarkable. What I don't think is unique is this detailed genetic code. There's no specific reason why the genetic code itself, the triplets of base codes for amino acids, should necessarily be the same. This is not necessarily unique in my viewpoint. Would you get something like the structure of the brain with the axons, the, the neurons, with axons feeding information through, uh, uh, dendrites feeding information through to a nucleus and then onto axions, and then going through um, across the synapse to the next one? Would you get something like that? Well, can you think of any other way of making a complex structure like a brain that will uh, process information. It's very, very difficult to imagine any other base, but of course we are limited in our imagination. Would you have this extraordinary process at the synapse when a chemical signal comes, uh, an electrical signal comes down, gets converted to a chemical signal which diffuses across, gets converted back to an electrical signal and then goes on. It's a very, very strange process which happens here at each synapse. Actually, there are good reasons for this very eccentric mechanism, which I don't go into now, but from a biological functioning of the brain, you can make a case this is a good way to do things, although it's so extraordinarily complex. I think there will be a convergence of the way the brain works also at the psychological level. And I'm really going out on a limb at this point. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's fun to speculate. And so I'm making this quite clear. I'm not telling you any established fact. I'm speculating wildly on a theory which you might like to think about. There are, as well as universal physical needs, universal psychological needs. If we were to meet them, would we find them companionable beings or would we, they would be total aliens we couldn't relate to? That's really quite an interesting question. I think there are psychological universals. We might well find them psychologically similar in makeup. That still allows an incredible variety, but let me explain what I mean. I think the following processes are universal. In order for a brain to make sense, it must first have a rationality function, an ability to take data, analyze it, compare it with the evidence. But there's never enough evidence that ties into some statements we heard before. And in the end, your rationality comes to an end and always in any real life situation, you've got a certain amount of evidence, you have to complete your data choices on the basis of faith and hope, your choices of actions, because there's never enough evidence to actually make the decision on the basis of rationality. Think of choosing your life companion, or your job, where you're going to do, where you're going to live even. You never actually, what shares you're going to buy on the stock market and all these kinds of things. You never have enough evidence. So faith and hope is always a part of making decisions. But emotions come in, and this is one of the crucial things which I think brain science can tell us, that actually most of our decisions are primarily made on an emotional basis, not a rational basis, and there are good reasons in brain science for this as well, which I don't really have time to go into here, but if you think about it, you will realize that most decisions, there's the emotional against the rational, and the emotion comes in first. It's a fast reacting system. The rational is a much slower reacting system, and you first tend to go the way the emotion says. You may change it according to rationality, but the emotions come in first. And the emotions, the primary ones, are hardwired. They're genetically inherited because they are our heritage from the animal forebears. The hardwired emotions give you quick responses. This is good for your survival, and you better go this way. And then your rationality looks and says, uh-oh, maybe that's not the right thing to do. There are secondary emotions that come in and also advise you that are social and cultural. And there's a crucial difference. These are genetically determined, and these are socially determined. The way that this balance between rationality and faith and hope work depends on perception and the way you see risk. 
and it depends on intuition. Intuition is a hardwired way of making rapid decisions again. You have intuition as a physicist or a ballet dancer or a motor mechanic. That is the hardwired data from your life enabling you, as a motor mechanic, you start the car, you listen to it and say, uh-uh, needs a new carburetor or whatever it is. You do that much quicker than a rational analysis. And you need to do that because rationality is too slow for many purposes. And what I'm claiming is that the kind of structure you're seeing here would be more or less inevitable for any other system which was highly developed in an intelligent living being. But there's one crucial further part. Values guide what is happening. And you have to balance your emotional pressure on what to do with your rational choice to do with the ethical decision, what is the right thing to do, which is not necessarily what your emotions say and not necessarily what rationality says. Ethics are causally effective and they govern everything else in the hierarchy of choices we make. For instance, if you believe it is okay to make nuclear weapons, you will have hardware sitting in your arsenals, nuclear bombs. So ethics is, in fact, effective in shaping our decisions because it's the top of the hierarchy of goals. So my proposal here, and this is where I'm really going way out, but I think it's a good suggestion. Each of rationality, emotions, ethics, faith, and hope are influenced by each of the other, with reason being the key player trying to bring the others into harmony. I think those might be universal. Once you've thought about it, it's difficult to imagine another kind of intelligent being which wouldn't have this broad kind of structure in the way that their minds work. Now, I admit that my imagination may not be big enough, but if you can come up with something else, I'd be very, very <laughs> interested to see it. What kind of ethics will they obey, these aliens? You see, there is ethics there, but I haven't said what kind of ethics, and that's where the crucial variation happens. There are all sorts of views on ethics. This picture I've just given you, this one here, does not say what kind of ethics. Will we have to fear them or not? Is there any reason to believe they will have the same kind of ethics as we have? Will it be ET or will it be Judgment Day? That's the question. Well, will we be friendly? <laughs> That's the converse question. <laughs> what is the nature of our ethics? As important, what kind of ethics will they think we have? The evidence going to them is very, very negative. There is a sphere of television programs speeding out from the Earth at the speed of light at this moment, conveying information to all those aliens about the way we view ethics. Those television programs are largely telling all those aliens that we believe in murder, mayhem, and killing and torturing people. If you turn on a random television program, within 10 minutes, there's a 90% chance you will see someone being murdered, tortured, or killed. And that is the information we are sending out to our colleagues out there if they exist. A classic, beautiful example of this was the film Contact, you may remember. Ellie is sitting at the radio telescope in that wonderful sequence. She gets in a signal, she struggles to decipher it, she deciphers it, and what does she get on the screen? Adolf Hitler at the 1937 Olympic Games, opening the Olympic Games. Why? Because the first television program we ever sent out was Adolf Hitler opening those games. And so that is the image, the first image which we've sent out there. It's not a very propitious message to have sent to everybody else. How can we approach them in a way that will make them think we're friendly and compassionate? Well, the first step is that we indeed become so. <laughs> 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 what kind of ethics do we obey? What's the future lifespan of the human ace? The previous was, in a sense, a fun thing. This is a real, genuine question. What's the future lifespan of the human ace? And I claim we will only survive if we make an ethical transition. We have been evolving for about, let's say, two billion years from our very earliest ancestors, the first amoeba. Intelligent life has been evolving for about, let's say, two million years. We have developed technology which is developing at a more and more rapid pace. That technology has approached the level where we are able to destroy all life on Earth. 
our ethical understanding has not been improving at the same rate. In fact, it has more or less stood still or maybe even gone backwards. And the question is, which is going to win? Our ethical, our ethical understanding in a way which will prevent the use of those nuclear weapons or biological weapons, chemical weapons, or will technology win and someone out there will use those weapons and destroy the entire human race? Will humans be on Earth 100 years from now, 1,000 years, 10,000, 100,000? That's a really, really good question. Actually, to be more positive, we have by and large actually been making progress. If, it, it's actually difficult to see this with all the bad news we're getting, but we're getting bad news for a considerable, <laughs> to a considerable degree because our news systems are so much better than they used to be. There used to be just as much bad things going on, but you didn't know about it. If you actually think about it, things have transformed for the positive remarkably over the past 2,000 years. For instance, we no longer have public burnings of peoples in the street of Cambridge, Massachusetts, or Cambridge, England. We no longer have slavery. Women's rights have been transformed over the past 100 years. Democracy has been transformed. I do not mean by that that everybody is democratic or that women's rights are okay. Everywhere. What I mean is the public ethos of the people on the earth as a global consensus has to a remarkable degree changed to believe in women's rights, to believe in democracy. So nowadays, you may not believe in democracy, but you try to pretend you do believe in democracy, even as you repress your subjects. The, the tenor of life has changed to a truly remarkable degree. And I think it's important to have that positive view on this, because actually we've made a huge progress. The way we treat mental patients has changed remarkably, even animals. We've by and large been making progress, but not enough to have any certainty we will survive another thousand years. It's touch and go, it's on the edge, in my opinion. Science by itself cannot provide the needed ethical transition to a compassionate way of life. Scientific and reductionist views of humanities are, if anything, promoting a dehumanizing view of humanity. We need more humane, ethics-based approaches to survive. So what is the true nature of the ethics we need in order to survive? This is this issue which was briefly mentioned by my introducer. There are many options that have been advanced through the ages through the nature of ethics. Some believe ethics is based on wealth. The more you have, the better you are in some sense or other. The consumer ethic. Some believe that ethics is based in power. The bigger your armies, the more ethical you are. The right, you, right might is right. In fact, I regret to say the church involved in this through thousands of years is an example of people who believed in power. Intellectual certainty is one approach, the idea of the intellectual. We will prove what is right, and that will persuade people, and they will have to follow it once they know what is right. All of these are, in my example, wrong approaches to ethics. They are partial but incomplete. The claim that I make is that deep ethics is kenotic, that is self-emptying. It is based in generosity, compassion, and love, and involves the capacity and willingness for forgiveness and reconciliation. I claim this is the genuine nature of ethics. As we heard from John Hort yesterday, it is persuasive, not coercive, a crucial difference. People often, when they say ethics, they think immediately of coercion, but to my mind, the true ethics is not coercive, it is persuasive. On occasion, this kind of ethics involves the ultimate of sacrifice on behalf of the other, even the enemy, because that is the way to turn the hardened heart, to convert an enemy to a friend, and so to create the true security that comes from being surrounded by friends rather than enemies. If you want true security, turn your enemies into friends. That's the route to true security. The only way to... <laughs> and the only way to do that is to treat them like humans, to treat them as valuable. And if, if when, when you are in an adversarial relation, the way you can break that is by this jujitsu, moral jujitsu, when you say, I'm doing something freely and voluntarily on your behalf. There's no coercion. I'm doing it for you because I believe you are a human being of value. The implication is not that one is always sacrificing on behalf of others, but rather one is prepared to do so when the context is such that a move of this kind can have a transformational quality. 
The result is paradoxical. Actions and understanding that does not make sense in the initial context can be suitable reactions in the transformed context you can create in this way. And I'm not saying it's easy, but the examples are very interesting. Martin Luther King, to my mind, was a wonderful example of this way, and Mahatma Gandhi was a wonderful example. From Parker Palmer, the idea that success is achieved by not worrying about success intersects the notion that we find our lives by losing them. The notion that we must empty ourselves to serve as channels for the Tao is echoed in the life of Jesus. He who renounced all worldly power, he who emptied himself and became obedient unto death, even the death on a cross, so that God's power could be shown. This is the deep view of this nature. And Einstein has this quote, we had this quote, sacrifice becomes grace, Einstein's way of saying the same thing. It moves ethics to a totally new regime, the arena of deep ethics that can indeed transform context and the situation in a way that's paradoxical because what was impossible in the old context becomes possible in the new. For the hardened cart can indeed on occasion be touched and transformed. This is the only ethics that can create true security. I've already said this. I that can create true security by fundamentally transforming the situation. It is recognized as an aspect of the highest good by all the major world religions. And I can speak on that from personal experience. I've given talks similar to this in many places. And I can confirm that there is a strand in the Jewish faith that believes in that, certainly in the um, Christian faith, certainly the Hindu faith, Mahatma Gandhi is a prime example, and in the Muslim faith there is also a strong streak which believes that this is indeed the nature of true ethics. In fact, I was giving a talk like this in California some years ago, and afterwards a very enthusiastic man came up to me, shook my hands with great vigor, said, that was wonderful, you spoke like a true Muslim. <laughs> In my view, therefore, with Nancy Murphy, we believe it is indeed the true nature of a realist universal ethic deeply embedded in the nature of the universe that will be discovered by the spiritually advanced people in any nation or kind anywhere in the universe. We believe just like mathematics is discovered, this kind of ethics is discovered and would be recognized as such by ethically advanced intelligent beings anywhere in the universe. Part of this is that in all actions, the means used are important as the ends, because you cannot attain ends based on one kind of values through means based on different values. And so the means used should be kenotic in nature in order to attain the good we envisage. Habitual use of kenotic methods transforms character, and deep ethics is about character transformation. It's easy in principle to see that respect for that of God in a person denies one the right to torture them, gives one the mental force to stand up to the police and the military when they pursue callous policies that lead to mutilation and deaths. This kind of vision, that of God in a person, enables one to support those oppressed by politicians and gangsters. But the point in the end is that this theme applies to the aggressor as well, to the oppressor as well. They too are human. They too have the light of God in them. And that's the fundamental point. If in your pursuit of the rights of one group, you turn in fury on your oppressors and kill them or torture them, then you too have fallen into the fatal trap. The infection of hate will have taken hold of you too and made you behave as the oppressors did. You will become what you said you were fighting. That's the fatal strength of hate. You see the horror of what someone or some group has done and therefore hate them with such a passion that you deny their humanity and behave in the same way to them. That's ultimately what we have to guard against. And this picture of the town of Dresden is the one which I always turn to there with the angel on the tower looking down on the ruined city, which was burnt, purposely burnt to death, uh, burnt in two nights of fire bombings with about 40,000 people burnt to death. And the question is, what distinguishes the people who did that from the people who burnt, who poisoned people in gas chambers? What's the difference? I want to say that this is, of course, incredibly difficult. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying that it is widely, widely recognized as being the deep way, and I just want to quote something which says this can be done in practical circumstances. Some of you heard this in an interview I did on public radio, but I'm going to give it to you again. In 1967, I was a young officer in a Scottish battalion engaged in peacekeeping duties in Aden Town in what is now Yemen. 
The situation was similar to Iraq, with people being killed every day. As always, those who suffered the most were the innocent local people. Not only were we tough, but we had the firepower to pretty well destroy the whole town had we wished. But we had a commanding officer who understood how to make peace, and he led us to do something very unusual, not to react when we were attacked. Only if we were 100% certain that a particular person had thrown a grenade or fired a shot at us were we allowed, were we allowed to fire. During our tour of duty, we had 102 grenades thrown at us, and in response, the entire battalion fired the grand total of two shots, killing one grenade thrower. The cost to us was over 100 of our own men wounded, and surely by the grace of God, only one killed. When they threw rocks at us, we stood fast. When they threw grenades, we hit the deck, and after the explosion, we got to our feet and stood fast. We did not react in anger or indiscriminately. This was not the anticipated reaction. Slowly, very slowly, the local people began to trust us and made it clear to the local terrorists that they were not welcome in their area. At one stage, neighboring battalions were having a torrid time with attacks. We were playing soccer with the locals. We had, in fact, brought peace to the area at the cost of our own blood. How had this been achieved? Principally because we were led by a man whom every soldier in the battalion knew would die for him if required. Each soldier in turn came to be prepared to sacrifice himself for such a man. Many people may sneer that we were merely obeying orders, but this was not the case. The Scottish soldier has scant respect for rank, but great respect for real leaders. Our commanding officer was more highly regarded by his soldiers than the general, one might almost say loved. So gradually, the heart of the peacemaker began to grow in each man and a determination to succeed whatever the cost. Probably most of the soldiers, like myself, only realized years afterwards what had been achieved. So what kind of ethics will we and they obey? We need a worldwide campaign to transform our ethics to a kenotic or compassionate ethics in order that humanity survive. Otherwise, we're not going to survive. It's as simple as, simple as that. We need world economics that shares resources and cares for the poor. We need programs to alter resentment to forgiveness. And Desmond Tutu and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in my country is a pretty successful example of that kind of project. We need programs to support deep ethics against fundamentalism. If we can meet aliens on this basis, we can hope they will respond. <laughs> if they have survived long enough, to undertake interstellar travel, then there's a good probability they will have made the ethical transition, because otherwise they would have killed themselves before they got off into space. Or at least they will not feel they have to destroy us if we do not manifestly threaten their survival. The conclusions. It's the overall set of laws and initial conditions of the universe that make our own existence possible. There's a considerable degree of fine-tuning of initial conditions and laws that underlies this existence. The ultimate reason this is so is a metaphysical issue that's undecidable through any scientific experiment. We cannot prove scientifically why these laws are fine-tuned. Positive ethics, sympathy, compassion, kenosis is crucial to our survival on this planet on a cosmological timescale, on a much shorter timescale, on a timescale of 150 years, 1,000 years, on our own and in a possible interstellar interaction. This is not attainable by science alone. We have to go to some other resources, philosophy, religion, spirituality, in order to be able to make the kind of ethical transition that is necessary. As regards the universe, Einstein said, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of true art and true science. And in cosmology, you end in multiple mystery. You cannot explain this fine-tuning. You cannot explain what it is which set the initial conditions of the universe. Cosmology, in the end, ends in mystery because you come past the limits of science. As regards the way to live, Einstein said, only a life lived for others is a life lived worthwhile. And that is part of the ethic which I'm claiming is the true universal ethic and is, in the end, the only way that humanity has a chance to survive in the long term as technology increases and the power to destroy ourselves becomes more and more widely available.
Uh, we'll start off with a comment from Pro Professor Levinson. Um, it's very difficult talk to comment on because mostly what you want to do is applaud. Um, and I only have a couple of, 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 of comments, um, mostly on the first part of your talk, because I think the, the ethical one I have n almost no dispute with. The only dispute I have with it is I would characterize your claim that the ethics you propose are universal as a hope I share, but far from proved as a fact of human social existence. And I, I mean, I really hope you're right. There's been plenty of evidence in this century that there is some movement in that direction, and there has been, a, as we all know, enough, enough evidence that that's not the case. Um, I'm going to sort of retail a comment to you that I had in discussing, discussing this issue in some detail with a number of people um, on an earlier project, uh, which is that while the fine-tuning problem is, is, is clearly present now, and the multiverse is one response, and various forms of either um, the, uh, the intersection of intelligent design arguments or, or other forms of the anthropic argument are being made to try and respond to that. Uh, one physicist, David Spurgel at Princeton, emphasized to me, there's an awful lot of physics between what we know now and the absolute necessity of resorting to the arguments of the multiverse or some of the other arguments. And it may be that what we have is less a, a requirement to discuss a metaphysical issue and more of a you know, God of the gaps or physics of the gaps argument that we just haven't got, you know, we are smarter than Einstein, but we're not necessarily smarter than, than two generations from now. I'd like to respond to that. <clears throat> Suppose physicists, you see, the, 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 the possibility of the multiverse arises because you have theories with adjustable parameters, at least that's in the, that's the simplest version. Now, the dream of many particle physicists is that we will get a unique one and only theory in which there are no adjustable parameters. That's, that's the, 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 the game. And there are even papers which say when that has happened, the anthropic problem will go away because there aren't any adjustable parameters. That answers the questions. To my mind, that will come back with a much more difficult metaphysical question because over here, you will have Lagrangian symmetry groups variational principles which lead to this unique fundamental theory. And then through the way which physics underlies complexity, you have life over here. Now, what we do know is that this theory in the middle, the effective theory of particle physics, if you vary the parameters, as I explained, you have to lie in a very, very small part of that parameter space in order that life exists. And so you would achieve a much more difficult fundamental philosophical problem. Why should it be that these variational principles should lead to those parameters lying in that part of parameter space which will allow life to occur? And in a sense, that's a much more difficult problem. If you're allowed to vary them, you can solve it by a multiverse. If it happens that way, you can't solve it by a multiverse. And it suddenly becomes an incredibly deeper problem. Why those laws, why, why should the group SO10 have life written into it. That's a much deeper philosophical problem. This is a, a, a much longer con conversation. <laughs> it, 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 the, all I'll say is it seems to me that, that another way of approaching it is you're giving life a special category of explanatory. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 indeed. If you view it as one more phenomenon among the many that the universe produces, it becomes less of, you know, we have, we have, a, personal pers we have a personal interest in the question. Yeah. I'm not sure that the universe does. Um, I do regard life as very special. I do regard it as needing explanation. And for those who don't regard it as needing explanation, all of that section falls away. It's not an issue. Okay. If I may. Sure. As I listened to your talk, I, many thoughts went through my mind. And I'd like to, I'm, I'm not sure I have any questions, but I would like to make some comments and perhaps you will have some response to them. I think the first of them is something that was highlighted in the first part of your talk, and it's also something that I often tell people when I talk about string theory. When you look at what we in science have come to understand about this place, our home, the universe, it is completely clear in terms of scientific statements that every single conscious human being in this, in our, on our planet has a kind of preciousness about him or her. 
because the universe has apparently undergone this 14 billion years of evolution to first create the conditions for life. Life gets started, creates the condition, which I think is of an even greater accomplishment for consciousness, which by the way, I think is the reason why we have to wonder about this, is why do we live in a universe which becomes conscious? That to me is the deep mystery, is why why does consciousness arrive? And so, to me, this is why people like you, and if I may compare, Albert Einstein, get, live, get driven to this thing I earlier commented that he called the cosmic religion, that it, in some sense it seems almost unavoidable. And yet we have enormous difficulty communicating this sort of deep spirituality which pervades fundamental science. We have an enormous difficulty communicating this to most of our fellow citizens, which to me is utterly remarkable. And so, could you comment on why do you think that is? I'd, I'd, I'd see two things here. Partly it is the sheer difficulty of science sort of drives people away, and that's part of this problem of communication that uh, well, one of the problems is people think science is what happens in a laboratory and it's got nothing to do with the real world. <laughs> That's one of the problems. But there is a problem that there is a group of scientists out there who are propagating precisely the opposite view. And I'm afraid it's right across the sciences. The classic examples are people like Dawkins, Atkins, to some extent Carl Sagan, and a group of people who um, Weinberg's famous point, it all looks pointless, there are a group of people who are saying specifically, and Dawkins, Atkins, um, Dennett are examples, that science contradicts religion, and of course their arguing is totally faulty, but they are out there saying it. And to some extent, they are responsible for the religious right rising, because if you believe Dawkins and so on, then if you're a religious person, you have to be anti-science. So one of the real problems, which the scientific community has not tackled, is trying to rein in the people who say that science contradicts deep humanity. And this is a problem particularly which is going to become worse and worse in the area of neuroscience where there's a group of neuroscientists out there, and at, uh, um, Dennett is the classic example. He has a book out recently the saying, Consciousness is an Illusion, which, if you take them seriously, undermines humanity as being valuable. And so I think there's a serious problem with what a group of scientists and philosophers are saying, which to some extent is responsible for this reaction you're talking about. Thank you, George. The other, I guess the other point I wanted to... Uh ask you about, or again get your, your reaction to, is that Einstein and certainly Abdus Salam once commented to me, and I'm sure he made the comment to others, that the moral or arm of the universe falls towards justice. So why yeah. <laughs> should we believe that, the, that there is some kind of almost encoding of morality and justice that we in science dimly see? What would your response to that be? I don't think science sees justice at all. Justice is not a scientific capacity, but justice is a true moral issue because in a sense, and it's what you see in the deep religions, is the tension between justice and love. It always is the tension. In a sense, the South African peaceful transition was given up precisely by saying we know it was unjust, but we would prefer to go for peace and community as against justice. If people had stuck with justice, we would not have had the peaceful transition. And there is a tension between those. Now, if I was to sort of take this to a deeper level, this is precisely the tension that Christianity tries to resolve through the deep nature of Christianity for those who are of that persuasion. But in any case, there is this tension. And it is kenosis which tries to bridge that tension between justice and love, as it were. And, and it's, a, it's, 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 it's a tension, not just, just at a high level, but in everyday kind of life. It's a tension in family life. Do I punish the child when he does something, or do I love them and love them out of it? It's, 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 it's a tension at all levels, from international through to family life. Um, Thank you. Before we spend our greatest brain power and billions of dollars on physics, shouldn't we build a human community 
that can live in harmony instead of pursuing its present course of violence and destruction of the earth. We'll let George start with that one. Well, I absolutely agree. The only problem, you can't build that community by spending money. It has to come by the will that needs inspirational figures. Incidentally, one of the things which I would just like to comment on, if I look back at the last century and ask who were the truly inspirational figures in a spiritual and ethical sense, to me they were Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and the Dalai Lama, who were all in a technical sense non-white men. <laughs> it's a kind of an interesting sort of comment. In a sense, the spiritual leaders arise out of repression, I think is part of the story to some degree. Um, Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu are amongst those I would include as the great spiritual leaders. What we have to do is build a society whose value is the values that I was trying to get across and which I think many of you, here, most of you here agree with. And it has to be done by example. It has to be done by analysis at, at, at all kind of levels. But it has to be a conscious decision. One of the things which it does require in a practical sense the, is, is the willingness to give up, I've talked about that, but it's the willingness of nations to give up on behalf of a world government. And right, Einstein wrote about that at quite a lot in a lot of what he talked about. Because nationalism, as he wrote about a lot, is one of the things. Nationalism sets you up against the others. And incidentally, this is one of the reasons why evolutionary biology does not provide the answer to ethics. Evolutionary biology provides mechanisms whereby the in-group gets to act in a um, positive way amongst themselves at the cost of defining themselves against the external group and setting up hostilities with the external group. I want to thank our wonderful panelists here. Uh, somebody told me last year that the reason that they like to come to this was they thought that Attending these two-day sessions here was sort of like taking a semester-long course in a topic here. And I think this group of people here probably came as close to achieving that as we could possibly hope for. The program series Nobel Conference, The Legacy of Einstein, is produced in partnership with Gustavus Adolphus College and TPT's Minnesota Channel.